bring those out, put them in your pocket, um, you know, if you're out in the field and uh, you don't have to have a concern about dropping your laptop or uh, getting it wet. Uh, there are also a number of telemetry options that are out there. Uh, it's great if you need real-time uh, measurements. There's, there's really no alternative. You, you must have that type of thing. Um, but if you don't need it, you probably don't necessarily want it either. They tend to be fairly expensive. Uh, they can add significant amounts of cost and complexity. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, any time that you're actually talking to a logger, you're generally consuming more battery power than you would be if you weren't. And so there are uh, battery implications to any communication, uh, particularly with frequent communication. So that just needs to be something that uh, is kept in mind. Um, and, and in some, some applications, you're really going to want a long communication cable. If you have the logger uh, deployed in a particularly hard to reach spot, you may need to have a communication cable so that frequent that brings it up to the surface so that you can download that log. Next, we're going to talk about software, and there are pretty much uh, four main steps that you're going to need to uh, use your software for. Um, and that involves setting up or configuring the logger, uh, reading out the logger. Uh, after the deployment, uh, and converting your pressure measurement to a, to a water level, uh, plotting the data, and exporting the data. Um, it's important that you don't uh, just blow by these steps because this is something you feel com comfortable with the software. You need to be repeatable uh, about how you do it. Uh, you definitely, especially if you have more than one logger, you need to make sure they're all launching the same way and you know exactly what you're going to get at the end of your deployment. First of all, on setup, um, as I said, it's, you, you, you want to be sure that you're going to that you feel comfortable understanding uh, the the setup screen. Um, and there are a couple of things that I want to sort of focus in on. Um, one of them is you should be able to set up a uh, sampling mode. Um, there are basically three common types of, uh, of sampling modes. Um, well, really four. The, the default one is the regular interval. Um, logging every uh, defined interval every minute, every 10 minutes. Um, but the other ones are uh, event-based sampling. Event-based sampling is allows you to start recording on a percentage change of full scale. This is handy for when you aren't really interested in real small changes, but you're looking for uh, a step change, and it only logs data when you need it logged. Um, it's, it can be very handy to where there is a pitfall there that in order to determine whether you have, whether there has been a change, the logger itself needs to be taking frequent measurements to check for change. And it's frequently when uh, in the data logger, it actually doesn't take very much energy to store a measurement, but it takes about the same amount of measure, it takes about the same amount of energy to make a measurement. So you might actually be, um, saving memory but chewing up a lot of battery in event days. But in some applications, it's, it, it's great to have. Um, many loggers have a logarithmic sampling mode, which is really handy for a pump down or slug test. Um, we set up uh, and read and use. And then there's also a, um, some loggers have a uh, user-defined logging intervals where you can set your, your own Find intervals for a certain number of points at a certain rate and switch to another number of points at a different rate uh, through multiple steps like that. That can be very handy, very flexible. Um, it takes a little bit more work to set up the first time, but once you have it, you're, uh, you're there. Another big question to ask yourself is how do I synchronize multiple loggers? Most people have more than one logger, uh, and so you want to have things so that your data is, is being recorded uh, at the same time, at the top of the hour, 15 minutes past the hour. Uh, it's, it's nice to be able to have that happen automatically without having to do a lot of manual entry or post-processing of the data. That should be very easy to use. And I, I, again, I focus in on the setup because the setup is where most of the errors occur and there's the types of errors that you can't go back and fix later. Um, you need to have the logger set up right the first time data analysis side, you can make some changes, but uh, the setup is very important to get that right, and it's important that you understand how, what you're doing when you set it up. Um, when you read out, uh, read 
out again. It, it seems like I'm always in the field when it's raining or it's cold or cold and raining. And so you basically you want the readout to be fast and reliable. You don't want to have to do it over and over again before you get a complete data file. Uh, USB, I, I think, generally helps there. Um, but but you just you want the data to transfer quickly. Uh, once you have the data, in order to uh, convert your your raw logger data to water level, you need to understand that these are pressure loggers. And, and sometimes manufacturers aren't entirely upfront about that. But what we're doing is reporting pressure and then converting that to water level. So in order to actually make that conversion, you need to enter in some information to let the software know how to make that conversion. Uh, one of those things is the fluid density. Uh, we've been talking about water level loggers, but salt water, fresh water, brackish water, you should be able to specify exactly what the density is uh, for your site, because uh, that does make a significant difference in the uh, overall accuracy. Uh, another thing that you would need to do if you're using a, an absolute system is uh, bring in that barometric pressure file, whether it's from another data logger that you've deployed or whether it's from a local weather station. You should be able to easily pull that data in and have it do the uh, barometric computation. Plotting. Um, most people don't do necessarily uh, real heavy duty uh, data analysis in the plotting, but it is very handy to have, um, to be able to first do a real quick preview. Uh, supposing you're in the field and you just need to be sure that the things are working properly before you redeploy the logger, it's very nice to be able to uh, quickly pull that up and doing, zoom in on the plot, um, drag in multiple data series, um, take a look at the min minimum and maximum values, daily, av daily averages, uh, what or whatnot. And if, if you're out in the field and, and you know, you're contemplating putting the logger back down in the hole, you need to be sure that uh, things are working properly. So the plotting is very handy there. When we get back in the office, advanced plotting features are a big help too. Uh, but fairly frequently, you'll end up wanting to uh, export your data into uh, third-party applications. Um, and so that's really the final software question to ask is, how do I do the data export? Uh, I've, I've, I've got my uh, readout. I've done the conversion to level. I've got it on my plotting screen. Now I want to take that and export it so I can bring it into my groundwater modeling software maybe even uh, into Microsoft Excel. Um, when you do that, you're going to want to make sure that you've got some flexibility in the export because of your date uh, in particular uh, is going to be exported in the format that you want. So you don't end up spending a lot of time manipulating your data to make everything line up properly. OK, so that generally wraps up the software here. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about deployment tips and some considerations. And, and these are things that uh, you know, we've learned and that are some of our customers. Um, so uh, the first thing I'll say, which is actually the last bullet on this slide, is reference measurements. Uh, it's very important that you take reference measurements at the beginning and ideally at the end of your deployment uh, and that you, that you try to make those as accurate as you can. In many cases, the reference measurement 